Hi again, folks, and welcome back to NTI's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima again. Thanks for joining us today. We've got another interview uh, lined up for you today. Um, with us on the line from Tokyo is Shai Greenberg, Vice President of Genkai Capital Management, which is an independent real estate investment management company. Their focus is mainly real estate fund management, asset management, and advisory services here in Japan, as well as in other parts of South Asia and North America. Shai, like myself, was born and raised in Israel, and after graduating from university there, moved on to Japan, New York for grad school, and a stint at a Wall Street investment bank, and back to Japan again, where he took on a senior management role at Cushman and Wakefield, where, similar to his previous positions, he dealt mainly with large real estate investment deals, representing large blue chip companies, institutional clients, Whereas today at his role at Genkai, he's also representing domestic institutional funds and so forth, dealing mainly again in larger commercial real estate projects, such as office buildings, logistics facilities, and so forth. A lot of the things that we've been talking here, uh, talking about here in past episodes. He's also an adjunct professor at both Tokyo Temple University and New York University, where he also studied real estate finance and investment teaching courses such as real estate investment fundamentals, including valuations, due diligence, finance, and similar subjects. So it's probably safe to say that he spent a substantial part of his adult life knee-deep in commercial real estate transactions, and a very large part of it here in Japan. He's also more, more than fluent in all things related to raising capital, structuring of funds, debt, equity, and so forth. So we thought it would be a great asset to have him uh, on the podcast. Shai, thanks so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. So before we start talking shop, could you maybe tell us a bit about your own personal journey? What led you to Japan in the first place? And maybe more specifically, when did the interest in real estate start? So, so Japan, you know, always had uh, some sort of uh, unexplainable attraction to Japan. So in my undergrad, I studied uh, the University of Southern Management and East Asian Studies with a minor in, in Japan, so Japan culture, literature, and also a little bit of Japanese. Nobody could actually speak after the, the graduate, but, uh, but the foundation was there. So I was looking for a way to get to Japan, and, uh, you know, from Israel, you either have IT or diamonds, which are, I think, the two uh, largest probably uh, outside of uh, security, but probably the two largest export industries. So for some reason, I don't know why, I think I thought diamond sounded more interesting. So I went to the diamond trade of the diamond dealer that got me to Japan in the first place. Okay. And you moved here in 2006 and then again in 2012. Is that right? Yes, that's right. So I came to Japan. Uh, at first I worked in, uh, as, a, as a diamond dealer. Uh, for for uh, uh, you know, uh, the beer site holder, and we're selling the wholesale to manufacturers and, uh, and uh, you know chain stores here in Japan. But uh, after a while, it got a little bit uh, boring. I was looking for more challenges, so uh, I decided to uh, go back to school. Um, went to grad school at NYU, studied real estate finance and investment, and then came back to Japan in 2012. Like you rightly said. Okay, so and how did you find the uh, transition into the Japanese working environment? I mean, there must have been a lot that struck you as completely different from the Western business environment, let alone the Israeli one that you were used to at the time. Oh my God, I mean, I'm still adjusting. <laughs> uh, I think it's a lifelong adjustment. Somebody uh, that started with me in New York uh, put it in a way, it says, you know, Japan is a moon colony. It's different than anything else you know, you've experienced mm. uh, ever. The way you negotiate, the subtleties, you know, where to push and where to, uh, you know, put your foot off the, off the, off the pedal and, and all of that uh, needs a lot of adjustment. So, um, you know, we, we, Israel is, tend to do well in uh, environments where, where it pays to be very aggressive, like New York, mm. but uh, in Japan, it's probably the other way around. If you lose your temper, you you basically lost. That's it. You're gone. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, throughout your time here, have you always been involved in mainly these larger commercial real estate mm. deals with local foreign investors? Um, 
How do you, do you find the profile of clients that you deal with different in their investment attitudes? Um, so I, I, I dealt with mainly um, inbound corporation who, in a previous role, who are uh, coming to Japan and were either missing uh, or, or buying or had a portfolio of properties that they inherited through M&A and wanted to know what to do with it, how to handle the portfolio, what's the best way to, uh, to utilize it. Um, so that was one side of investment. Now I'm working uh, in a Japanese company, and most of, the great majority of our investors are institutional Japanese investors. So they have a lot of uh, different needs and wants and different, uh, you know, cost of capital, etc. So either we, we're doing things domestically with them or uh, outbound as well, looking at outbound investments as well. Right. And... Uh, how about finance, raising capital, um, or do they always come with their own capital or structuring um, their equity-based deals? I mean, we offer, for example, here complaints from foreign investors um, about the reluctance of Japanese banks to lend to anyone who doesn't have a, a really well-established corporate or at least a residential base in the country. Um, when you deal with foreign investors, do you find this to be true? Have things changed at all? Um Generally, I believe it to be true for uh, the smaller property types. What's happened when you deal with the larger property types, you get into specific investment structures that kind of like mitigate that risk. A lot of the larger properties are actually, uh, if you pull out the, the title for the property, you see it's owned by one of the trust banks. So basically, the property is sold to a trust where the trust is issuing, uh, you know, trust uh, beneficiary interests that are held by the, the, the investor. Actually, the owner will not be the investor, it will be the trust bank. And similarly, there is uh, you know, all those fund, fund or syndication structures like uh, GKTK or TMK, where you actually have an asset manager, such as ourselves, licensed asset manager with a good track record. Um, so that and the, and, the, and the loans of this size are non recourse loans in any case. So they're not really looking for personal guarantees. So if there is a, you know, experienced local uh, manager with a track record, even though, uh, you know, most of the economic interest is held by a foreign entity, that is still uh, works for the local lenders and their capital and money for those type of deals. Okay, so that's very different from what um, we're used to uh, dealing with, with the um, smaller or the individual investors. So where do, you, where do you think that line is drawn? Is it a matter of um, deal size that makes it easier or the profile of the uh, ownership? When does it actually change from a reluctance to lend into a, more of an acceptance for foreign investors? So that, that, you know, doing all this structuring is obviously not without cost. And so it only makes sense for larger deals. So I think I would say you probably see um, the non recourse loans start from probably around, uh, I would say, 10 million units right. and upwards. Yeah. Where anything below that um, is, is probably a recourse deal. But a recourse deal, yeah, I mean, you know, put yourself in the lender's shoes, right? I mean, if you have. The power that is not a resident of that country, uh, regardless if it's a, it's a fantastic power, but in, in their narrow point of view, it's a, it's a flight risk. So if they lend money and, and things go south and they need his recourse, they need to put their hands on his properties, etc., it's very difficult or close to impossible for them if everything he owns is, is in Australia or you know, in the US or, or somewhere in Asia. Um, so that's why I think this is the reason why they try to uh, avoid those borrowers. So having the property that's being purchased itself as security would not be sufficient for them? Most smaller loans, they look at it as full recourse loans. You know, um, I'm sure we're going to mention uh, um, in the recent, uh, you know, recent... Uh, events in the capital markets in Japan uh, later on, but, um, you know, in, in a great, to a great extent, a lot of the smaller banks 
look at it as a personal loan with uh, the benefit of uh, security of a property. Right, so they want to go after the investor in person if they have to. Yeah, because otherwise the loan that, they, the loan that some of them made makes absolutely no sense in the context of real estate only loan, right? Right. So it took me a while to understand why, why some of the banks were you know, lending the way they're lending, but then I figure out, well, it's, if you look at it in the sense of it's a, it's a consumer loan with the benefit of having a, a you know, security of, of, of a property, it made a lot of sense. Oh, it does actually, yes. Okay, that makes it a lot clearer for me too. And did, did you see any, um, any changes uh, maybe this year? We had the surrogate scandal. Um, yeah, there was a... That was uh, what I was alluding to. I mean, um, for those of you who don't know, there was a, a bank that was probably one of the most aggressive lenders, uh, and they lended to a lot of groups that were uh, kind of like unloved by the couple of markets in Japan. So a lot of foreigners, uh, people with may, maybe uh, lower credits, um, and. They were very aggressive. They were lending at very high loan to value ratios. It, it, properties that were, um, let's call it, not the best properties, some of them. And as it turned out to be, they were, um, uh, had a lot of, um, defaults on the, on the loan book because of one specific, uh, deal with, uh, share housing company called, uh, Kabuchan Obasha, mm. that they had a very, uh, large concentration of loans with them, and it turns out to be that they were uh, overly aggressive on the underwriting, etc. So the regulators stepped in and started looking at all of their books, uh, find out a couple of things. Uh, senior management stepped down, and there were ripple effects across the entire uh, couple markets, uh, full recourse loan by lenders, banks that kind of like took a step back and said, okay. You know, very conservative, they to wait and see, see what's going on. Maybe we don't want to uh, be the next one on, on the regular uh, calling list. Mm. And, and you felt that? Yeah, I mean, you, you physically felt effects in, in your work as well? So, us not so much, because we didn't, so the 10 million up, the, reco- the re- non-recourse uh, lending mm. world, did not really see the effect of that, but uh, I know that smaller, uh, smaller loans, uh, so, so smaller properties had a lot of effect. They were loving the professional Japanese uh, real estate media about uh, how much of a hit some of the larger uh, publicly traded uh, brokerage shops took because of that, etc. So there was definitely an effect, a big effect on the real estate market. And, and some of the, some of the companies that do, we, we do work with that has, uh, let's say, large uh, apartment uh, development arms, apartment as in uh, not condominiums for sale, but condominiums for investment, right. they took a hit too because a lot of those uh, salarymen investors uh, could not get loan. All right, so the, the, pers- the effect on the personal loan market also affected the, the property uh, arena. Exactly, exactly. All right. Okay. Well, I mean, you're probably in a bit of a unique position. You've worked with both um, domestic and foreign investors, and you're dealing with property investments both in and out of Japan. Could you maybe point out some um, current trends for us as far as the interest in Japanese real estate goes, domestically, internationally? I mean, from our, um, again, limited perspective on on our end of the market, it seems as if there's more interest in the market here since um, uh, Abisan took over in 2012. But... Over the last two, three years, there seem to be a lot less attractive deals um, to be found. Investors are maybe holding on to their assets, maybe because there just aren't that many good alternatives around. Um, have you noticed similar or, or maybe a different impression? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's extremely difficult to find good deals. Um, in general, especially the, the better quality, high, you know, very expensive type of real estate rarely changes hands. It's always kept by the, the, the developer group that owns it. Think about Maronouchi area in Tokyo. I mean, none of those buildings uh, hardly ever trade, right? Mm. Those type of uh, uh, you know, class A uh, office buildings hardly ever trade. So it's very difficult 
tipo vai di poche delle c'è a Southern Wealth Fund, something like that, it needs a big investment to move the middle for them to come to Japan and buy those type of billion plus properties. That's rarely ever happens. Uh, it's, 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 it's tough, um, for sure. And smaller deals? More available, less available? I think, I think on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, like individual investor type deals, I think there's a lot more liquidity. Uh, on um, let's say 10 million plus uh, there's there's more liquidity yeah, I mean the, well, it's a pyramid right the, the, the lower you get the more the more liquidity you have mm. things are, are trading I think maybe now with the smaller properties um, because of what happening in the capital markets uh, there might be some properties that will Reluctantly be put on the market, but uh, maybe I don't. I don't think there will be a wave. I think it will be maybe a property here, a property there, because those loans are typically written for a very long duration, so maybe thirty year loan. So there really is no, you know, refinance event that you need to refinance in five years. And oh my God, I can get a loan. Yeah. And I got to sell the property. That, that's not going to happen. Um, but if there's a default, it might happen. Okay, and in that space, in the entire commercial space, what what types of properties are getting the most attention, in your opinion? So, um, last couple of years, uh, for sure, uh, you know, the bell of the ball was uh, logistics, uh, similar to what happening in other places in Japan too. Uh, Amazon, we have our own version of Amazon, that came. Uh, are increasing in sales and, and decreasing their delivery time. Uh, so logistic properties uh, are popping up everywhere, up until a point that everybody got into this game. And some markets are said to be overbuilt, but it's still going very, very, very strong. Mm. So that's for sure. Um, in recent years, you know, there has been a tremendous growth in uh, inbound tourism to Japan. Like unbelievable uh, to a stable economy, you know, uh, like Japan to see in any industry a growth of forty percent, thirty percent, twenty some percent year over year, it's tremendous. So a lot of people are also getting into the business of building hotels. A lot of the international brands really, really want a foothold in Japan if they don't have one already, and so everybody are are, are, are joining into this uh, asset class as well. Gotcha. So hospitality definitely a thing. Do you think that's going to peter off towards the um, Olympics or the World Day, or right after the Olympics or the World Expo, or will that be a lasting trend? I mean, my personal opinion, I think it's a lasting trend because I think Japan is just a fantastic tourist destination. Mm. I think everybody that comes to Japan, do you agree? Yeah. And, and I think that everybody comes to Japan, uh, A, they come again. Because when they come to Japan the first time, it's a week, and they see all the uh, Kyoto and Tokyo, and that's it. And the next time they go to the se second cycle, and, and third time they go to the third cycle of cities, and there's a lot of great places to see in Japan. But not only that, when they come to Japan, they're surprised, because everybody has the image in mind that Japan is the most expensive place exactly, in the world. Exactly, that's what I was but thinking. But it's not anymore. Mm. It's not anymore for 12, you know, 15 years of, of depression. Uh, sorry, um, uh, deflation. You know, yeah. Deflation. Yeah. yeah. When you know, when you when you come here and you compare the meal cost to the restaurant here versus the meal cost of the restaurant than almost any other city in the world, it's actually pretty affordable. Right. And hotels as well, and and transportation, except for maybe uh, bullet trains, also not that expensive. So, so so it's a great destination. They go home and they tell you know, the five friends that they meet every Friday about about what they found out. And then those five friends come. And those five friends tell the other five friends. And this is this is a virtuous cycle, I think. I don't think it's going to go away in cancel. Okay, so hospitality, definitely a thing, um, pro hopefully beyond the next few years. Uh, logistics facilities you've mentioned. So e-commerce moving towards um, next or same-day delivery. Um, anything about um, assisted senior living? We've been hearing quite a lot about that um, just due to the aging population. Yeah. Uh, one caveat about the hospitality before I go, that, you yeah. know, 
very large chunk of the tourists coming to Japan are from China. So if anything happens with the China-Japan relationship or the Chinese stop traveling or something like that, that Japanese tourism may take it then. They're doing, they're trying very hard to diversify the inbound tourism portfolio and, and, and I hope they'll be able to make it. But uh, that's what we cover. Regarding uh, senior housing, uh, we're also investing in senior housing, but um, it's, the promise is there. I mean, it makes a lot of sense when you look at the demographics, but, and there's now uh, a couple of uh, REITs, but if you look at the REITs, uh, which, which is in the, in the public market, so the information is there, you see it, it hasn't taken off. It's a difficult asset class because there is really a very limited uh, amount of uh, credit worthy uh, operators uh, with lim- limited capacity and all and a lot of very, very granular mom and pop owned small properties that are not investment great if you're looking at you know those type of rich type uh, and there was also um, an issue about a year back with some uh, terrible incident in a, in a, in a senior facility where one of the uh, caregivers was throwing elderly people off the balcony. Like oh, I remember that one, yeah. And that, the entire business took a turn because people invested in thinking, well, it's like multifamily, it's like office, but actually there are other risks because you know, people's lives are in stake. Mm. So that's another consideration. It seems like a, like a like a very uh, logical play, but for some reason it hasn't taken off yet. Okay. okay, maybe it's just for lack of, like you say, um, larger operators um, who can, um, because you've also mentioned at the start that the um, the financing would be tied into the asset management, right? Yes. So if uh, if we don't have any large operators that are um, credible and um, and can be counted on, that's going to be a problem. And maybe there's just not enough. Um, just business models out there to support that. Any Anything about um, shared office spaces? We've seen that to be um, here in Fukuoka and in Tokyo as well. That seems to be taking off a bit. Yeah, I mean, that, that concept has been uh, around for a while. I mean, I think Japan is one of the uh, bridges and, um, uh, you know, the other operators, uh, large markets. But it's been on steroids since, uh, we work in yep. town. Uh, we work in town, and they're just taking up a lot of office space, uh, filling out really, really nice. And they're running on very, very high uh, occupancy rates uh, from the get-go. So uh, the business model seems to be taking off in Japan as well. Interesting. Um, any particular challenges that you see for domestic international investors? Um, again, leading into the uh, Olympics, we've mentioned hospitality, but then we had a whole big thing with, um, you mentioned people are building hotels, but Airbnb took a serious hit here. Um, yes. So a- any particular challenges uh, on any of those fronts? Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to see the if the Olympics itself, you know, the momentum is great, but I'm not sure if the Olympics itself would have such a huge effect on commercial real estate, uh, aside maybe from hospitality, but I think hospital would have some really, really good year after the Olympics. Um, you know, if you look at other cities that had hosted the Olympic Games, the best years of hospital were, were not the Olympic year, but the following years, because I'm sure they're going to have very really nice problems of Japan and Few people are eager to come and watch people run, but yeah. they all watch it on TV, uh, you know, one time or the other. So mm-hmm. say, wow, this Japan looks really beautiful. I want to go. And they come the next year or the following year when they, when they save money for it. And I think there is a lot of um, capacity on the side of construction workers that will free up once uh, the Olympics is gone. Because a lot of the construction work I, I tied up with either reconstruction after the natural disasters or uh, abenomics related infrastructure projects or the Olympics. But once the Olympic is done, you have a lot of capacity. So that will probably affect uh, secondary market condos. 
a lot of developers are sitting on land parcels that are unable to develop because construction costs are too expensive. So once that, uh, and, and they're too expensive not because of commodity prices, but because of shortage of labor. Mm. So once that labor is released to the market, I think those projects are going to start uh, getting built, and that might affect apartment prices in uh, secondary markets because you don't have more supply. Okay, so residential is, uh, might see an uptick. Uh, anything else in the residential sector um, that we should be looking out for? Um, share houses, again, we've mentioned share offices. Share houses are also expanding. Um, anything exciting in the residential sector that you're aware of? You, you mentioned that uh, Airbnb took a hit in Japan. Mm. Um, it, it took a hit um, where a lot of individual owners were listing uh, properties that now a little bit difficult to do, but what you see, you see, is, you see a wave of smaller developers uh, taking over buildings or developing properties and uh, licensing them as a uh, dormitory, uh, which allows you in turn to uh, lease it as Airbnb. So you really, really see a wave of those uh, coming, another version of a multifamily, so they take over the entire multifamily, so they don't have to worry about what the what the other tenants think, and they get the license, and then they can register it uh, according to the Japanese law. So there's absolutely no issue with that. You see a lot of, I think there's a lot of opportunities in that space. So when you say dormitory license, is that a, a, a sub branch of the hotel or the yokan licensing? Yes, it's 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 slightly less less requirements in terms of fire safety, pulling on. Uh, reception on the on the ground floor, etc. So it's a it's a it's a little bit of an easier route. Okay, that that's brilliant. Thanks for your time, Chai. That was um, very educational for myself as well, and hopefully profitable for many of our listeners. <laughs> Thank you very much. Folks, if you've got any questions at all for Shai, please feel free to post them in the comment section of wherever you might have found this episode, or directly on our podcast page on Podigy itself. You can find them all of those easily. Just Google Japan Real Estate Podcast or search the iTunes store for Japan Real Estate Podcast. We're always first on that list. Do share this content with anyone who may find it interesting on your own networks. And most importantly, if you can spare a moment of your time, please leave us a rating. Uh, leave us a rating, good or bad, on the iTunes store, on Spotify, wherever you might have found us. We look forward to having you with us next time. And until then... From all of us here at NTI and Genkai Capital, we wish you, as always, happy investing.